Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you. And today I'm going to be taking a look at my second DDR4 motherboard. I have actually asked all of the motherboard vendors to send me some DDR4 boards, but the stock and excuses and whatever. So the first one, other than the original one I did at launch, the first one to arrive is the Strix A from Asus. It's a whiteboard, which kind of sets it well with me in the first place, but the fact that I get to test another DDR4 board and then do some overclocking with it and messing around actually sits really well with me. The only thing that doesn't is it's kind of a mid to lower end board. It's not one of their top end boards, but the price is still £300. But if you think about it, some of the DDR5 boards that are around are £500 plus. I mean, it's easy to find a five or six hundred pound DDR5 motherboard, and then you can't actually get DDR5 at the moment either. So this could be a really nice and tidy way of getting your white theme system up and running, and then not necessarily having to pay the eye-watering prices or playing the waiting game to get DDR5. And to be perfectly honest with you, the performance doesn't have to be a letdown. So in reality, there isn't a great deal in the box. You get your Wi-Fi antenna, you get a new style ROG keyring. It's not red. It's not like the red ones that you keep seeing. It's it's white, so that's a bit different. You get four SATA cables. You get some white stickers or white and silver stickers, and then it's basically just like welcome cards and your driver CD and manual. So in the box is incredibly light. But the full system itself, da -da, we can have a look as we go around here. Now, top left hand corner, dual eight pins, which I've fitted. And then you can see a four pin PWM header, which I have not used. But when we slide across, doo -doo 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 -doo, there we go. You can see a four pin header fitted. Then You've got a couple of RGBs. That is a three pin and a four pin, so an addressable and then a non-addressable down past your 24 pin. One of the things I will say as well is if you want uh, to look at this in more depth, you can go to the OC3D really website because there's loads of pictures there. But as I'm trying to save time, uh, I didn't want to take the board back out again to uh, do this bit of the video. Then you've got USB 3.1 Gen 2, USB 3.1, then the hallowed switch so that you can take your graphics cards out much easier. There are six SATAs around the back. There's a weird uh, tag there, which is Velcro, uh, goes on the heatsink. You can't even really see that well anyway. But just coming back up here, zoom in, there are hidden a couple of uh, PWM headers just to the bottom of the left hand side of the CPU header, which if you're going air cooling, then fair enough. But if you're not, and then if you think about it, a lot of people are going to be in trying to drag cables over there. It's like, no, they should go up and out the top. Like my one is just there. And if you think about the amount of times I have to remove motherboards and then rebuild them again, and I still go to that level to uh, do it. I don't want an award, but I'm just saying you can do it once. Then down the bottom, of the motherboard. You get your front panel headers. And then you can see a couple more PWMs down the bottom. Two USB 2. So I've got a, that one there is a one into two splitter. But you do have two headers there. Then Thunderbolt header, a couple more RGBs. Again, a four pin and a three pin. Actually, no, that's two three pins. I do apologize. And then another fan header. Now in total, there are four slots for NVMe. You've got the big long one at the bottom, which is two. Then another small one above, which is a single one. And then another single one at the top, hidden underneath this don't work, game first, work second kind of BS, which I really don't understand. Yeah, don't worry about working. How are you going to pay your electric or your games if you're always playing games? Oh, I don't know. Okay, anyway, so it's a decent layout. Now, the... 2080 Ti that's in there we've been using for a while and so we can actually compare 
<clears throat> results. People do often say to me, why have you not gone straight up to a 30, 90 or something? And it's just like we actually like consistency with the results so that we can see if we've got benefits from board to board and also platform to platform. So we could drop these results directly into an X570 set of results, for example. And because we test them so similarly, uh, there'd actually be a fair comparison. So it's not as Gucci and as flashy as uh, some results, but the, uh, the way that we do it, we feel, is just uh, more comparable. And then that means for you guys at home, should be more useful as well. If you just want the flashy stuff, then fine. Go and watch the flashy stuff. Okay then, peeps, so on to the testing. And I do just want to clarify something, because it does keep coming up in the comments. People keep asking me why I keep reusing the Define Excel case. Now, the reason is, is because I test all the motherboards in exactly the same way, in exactly the same case. If I change the case and do a build every time, then the VRM temperatures wouldn't be fair. Uh, and that's just one of the reasons in reality. We like to keep a static system and really the only component that should be changing in a rig if you are reviewing it with the way that we do it is the part that you're changing, which is why we have this setup for motherboards, we have a completely set up, different setup for graphics cards, and so on and so forth. So, stock results actually did kind of well. Temperatures were all nice and low, scores were very healthy, as you'll see in a minute. But what I do want to talk to you about is the AI overclock and then the manual overclock. So the AI overclock is something that Asus have introduced we can just go into the BIOS, basically hit AI overclock, and it overclocks the system for you. Now these, in the past, have been plagued with problems, and they have got better. Now at launch, the AI overclock actually managed to decrease the scores on the Hero, and I blamed it on an early BIOS. Asus kind of agreed that it needed a little bit of work and that's one of the reasons why we didn't use the AI overclock at all in there because it was dropping performance by 25 to 30%. Moving on to this, scores have gone up but, and this is quite funny, if you have a look at, I've done some b-roll and I've got some screenshots but it's actually saying that for however long, I mean we've got in the B-roll, you can see that it's saying that the cores are running at 5,500 megahertz. That will be a single core, uh, and it will be flicking up to that. But you can see also it doesn't really sit there for very long. The other thing that I can say is I do have a screenshot where it says it's managing to get the cores at 5.8 gigahertz. But in the results themselves, because we've done a few Cinebench runs just with AI overclock, I didn't want to do another whole suite, because it takes me like seven hours to do a full suite of tests. Uh, the the uh, AI overclock stuff, single core actually was a healthy response, but multi-core, it actually was so close to stock, it really wasn't even worth having it on. So it's a bit of a, uh, and I think what the problem is, is it's trying to push things too far. Because, for example, if I, uh, on my overclock, I had 52 for the first four cores and then 51 for the next four cores. So if you're running any more than four cores, the whole CPU will then run at 5.1 gigahertz. Now the weird thing was, I could literally lose 500 points on Cinebench just by changing the single core, like the first single core one, if I change that to uh, 53, so 5.3 gigahertz, the multi-core result would lose at least 500 points because it's still trying to mess around too much uh, and I think that is the inherent problem with AI overclock is that it's trying to push all of the single stuff far too far and then you don't get any uh, multi-core benefit to the point I would still say at this present moment in time I don't actually see the point in putting AI overclock on you can see the core speeds move all over the place when uh, it's under load and it's just not consistent. You get far too many drops below the clock speeds that you would expect. So in reality, the average clock speed ends up not being uh, that much of a benefit. So uh, with the way that I do it, first four 52, second four 
51, and then on the E cores, it's 41 and 40. Uh, I managed to get that uh, nailed in with quite a decent voltage as well. We were running 1.25 volts on that. I will also say that the AI overclock, the voltages on them were high, like very high, and the temperatures really weren't that great either. But the other problem with the AI overclock is then when you're doing thermal testing, because it's trying to boost them like to the moon and back, uh, that's one from Matt at Matt Pro. To the moon, send it to the moon. Uh, anyway, so uh, when you do that, it basically goes too high and then comes right back down again and then goes too high and then comes back down again and then the temps all start to get uh, increased and it's just, it still needs refinement. I've personally never been a fan of auto overclock stuff anyway and, you know, this one, as you can see with the results, it's just for the extra heat and the temperatures and the fact that it's just up and down and up and down and up and down, it's just not consistent. So I think you're better off. Uh, either leaving it alone or turning on the MCE uh, because these are all done with MCE off. Just turn on the MCE or uh, MCE is multi-core enhancement or just do a manual overclock because it's actually like genuinely not that hard. Uh, you do have to invest a little bit of time but it's sometimes it's nice just to get in there and learn and if you're not that keen on the BIOS because you find it scary you've literally just got to hit delete when it's posting. Restart can be a bit difficult, do a shutdown, then go back into it, hit delete, get in there, go and play. If it goes wrong, clear the BIOS, there's a button on the back, simple, goes back to stock, easy. Uh, and you can save uh, profiles and stuff in the BIOS, it's genuinely something that I would encourage everyone to do because then when things start to go wrong with your system after you've had it for a year or two or three, uh, you'll actually, you'll be like, oh yeah, it might just need a little bit of a tickle on that and it, you'll just get to know it. Anyway, so the overclock, I have told you my overclock settings and they were fruitful to say the least. So the single thread uh, Cinebench R20, if you actually look at the single bench uh, AI overclock, you'll see that's actually gone to the top of the grass. It did put a decent lump on, but you'll also see that the uh, when we flick it over onto the multi-threaded side of it, when you feel, fit, put that into the actual graph itself, away from just a single intensive core, it's, it's just above the, the stock stuff. And in reality, uh, it happens throughout the testing. I mean, the Cinebench was the only ones I was doing on the AI overclock, so I just wanted to get some quick numbers, smash, bang, smash, bang. I didn't want to do a full sweep because once I looked at the scores and realised from one benchmark, I was like, oh, okay. Um, not really going to waste seven hours on that. So then I just moved on with the manual overclock. Gaming, it did quite well. Far Cry 6 and Far Cry 5, absolutely loved, to the point that the manual overclock topped the graph. One of the things I will say about the graphs, though, is you can actually see the uh, original hero. That was actually the results from the very, very first uh, i9 CPU review I did and then I just because it was done on the hero I then put it into the motherboard graphs you can actually see that it's actually trading places with that and you need to remember this is a DDR4 board as well now the only really weird one we had was uh, Sandra um, uh, cryptography where the results looked a bit hinky that is one that when I get a bit more time I'll go back and I'll try and work out what's going on it hasn't updated the benchmark I don't know why two of them were so off, but the fact that the stock and the overclock were so off, um, and we do have the uh, D4 in the graph, these ones look a bit out of place. But I'm just drawing attention to this in case it is a ball problem, but we're not really gonna know until we do a little bit more investigation to see what's going on. Uh, VRM temperatures, middle of the graph, but again, still lower end board, yet it's, I mean, when you think about the fact that I'm running, I, okay, I don't turn AVX on with Prime. I run Prime for 30 minutes and absolutely batter the CPU for those 30 minutes. I use the um, small FFTs as well, maximum heat, maximum power draw. I stress them out hard. And as you can see, it, it's, it's not the coolest, like the Hero did exceptionally well on that, but considering that there is still plastic over the top of the main... VRM heatsink and it's done that well, I think it's actually a fairly healthy result, especially when it is kind of 
mid to lower end or lower mid range uh, board. But overclocking, once you got manual, was actually quite easy. You just need to pay attention to the little things. One of the things I did notice was when I was running the benchmarks, what I do is I, I watch the clock speeds in the hardware monitor. And sometimes when the, you watch the hard, uh, those in hardware monitor, you'll see them start to back off. Now, there's a couple of things that you may have to tweak at that point. It possibly could need a few more volts. Not a lot, but it could need a few more volts. There's also the power limit in uh, the Digi Plus that you can go in and you can turn that up. And you can also go into the settings where you've got the uh, Intel limits and you've basically got BIOS optimized, disabled, so effectively like all the Intel limits and then you can uh, release all the Intel limits and it not have any of them. Uh, and that's another one that you can go in and make a change on. So if you've got something like Cinebench where it's using all the cores and you're telling it you want them all to run at 51 and then it's running at 51 but then suddenly you see, see things going back to like 5 gigahertz and 4.9 gigahertz, that's either not enough power or not enough volts. So that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a tip for you at home that actually do like to get your hands dirty and have a play with these things. Um, and then uh, I managed to tune all that out so I was getting lovely, nice and stable. Literally, when I put Cinebench or Blender on, it was like, bang, sat there at 51.8 or 50.098. So like within a few megahertz, either side of the 5.1 is absolutely fine. And it sat there strong consistently once I'd got in and done those uh, finer tuning points. But that's one of the things I always try and spend, I mean, it took me an afternoon to get the overclocking play on this, but that's the sort of time I spend on uh, all of the boards. And this was just one of the easier ones. The fact that it's a reasonably priced board based on the fact that some of them are just like kidney level prices. But anyway, it's white, so I'm going to like it. I do think they could have put a bit more white on it though. I actually personally think that the uh, lighting on that top corner is a bit half assed It's just a bit meh. And Asus have got such a good history with getting lighting on the boards done in a really nice way. The fact that they've just stuck that over with some bits around it, it's just like, oh, really? So I was a bit disappointed by that. The fact that they've also gone over the uh, VRM heatsink, whether they copied Gigabyte or Gigabyte copied them, I don't know. But really, I mean, come on, boys. Like, you're either going to do it or you're not. You'd have been better off just having a smaller bit, just in white, and then putting some lights scattered around the board or something. That's where my head's at. Anyway, you can tell me otherwise, because obviously aesthetics is a personal preference. But uh, Z690A... D4, comes with DDR4, and I still think at the moment, when you consider the fact that all of the DDR5, no one seems to have any. It's all gone to system integrators. And why is that? Because it's all going into pre-built systems. Possibly. Uh, so it's really hard to get DDR5 anyway, so if you're looking for a decent upgrade, I actually still think, if you think some of these results have topped the graph and how healthy this looked, even at stock, I'm still very much of the opinion that I genuinely don't see the point in going DDR5 yet. We need stock for starters, we need prices of it to come down as well. So for now, something like the Strix A D4 is perfect if you want to go 12th gen. If you're also looking for a lower end board that you want to go white with and do a white build like I kind of like to do with like graphics cards like Power Color Hellhound, it's a white graphics card I can just grab nice and easy. I know you're like, oh, it's on the side, you should be using it, but it actually gets used in games reviews all the time. Uh, so that is where I would swing with it. So cracking board, it's the right end of the price spectrum and it's on, as far as I'm concerned, at the moment, the better option of DDR4 as well. What's not to like? Cha-ching. Love you, sis.